Hello, this is Professor Erica Jones here to talk to you about functional health patterns. Um, the outcomes from this lecture is that you will be able to identify different methods of data collection associated with the functional health patterns, describe how these patterns, these, these clusters of patient data, identify possible problem areas and lead to nursing diagnoses, you're expected to understand how a thorough functional health pattern can uncover problems that are treatable with nursing diagnoses. And we're gonna talk about assessment data. And we're gonna also talk about assessment data and the interview questions that are associated with each functional health pattern. And your homework is to complete a functional health pattern on an adult individual. This is one of the things that you will be doing in your clinical rotations on uh, your patients and it's good to have some practice. So functional health patterns are a framework for assessment that were developed by Marjorie Gordon in the mid 70s to teach assessment and diagnosis. The term pattern is used to refer to a series of behaviors rather than isolated events and there are 11 functional health patterns. They are used to cluster and organize data they provide a nice structure for grouping nursing diagnoses. They are also used as a system for organizing clinical literature and they can be used as topics for clinical research. And a quote from Marjorie Gordon, all human beings have in common certain functional patterns that contribute to their health, quality of life, and achievement of human potential. The description and evaluation of these health patterns will allow the nurse to identify functional areas, areas where clients have strengths, and dysfunctional areas, which are areas that we would be able to treat with nursing diagnoses. The advantages of AFHPs are that they guide the collection of information, they do lead directly to a nursing diagnosis, and they encompass a holistic approach to human functional assessment in any setting for any age group and at any point on the health illness continuum. So for example, you will be going into the long-term care setting this semester and talking to your patients. And if you notice that you are asking questions about you know, belief and spirituality and your patient really um, you know, is involved in the conversation and they tell you they are a very spiritual person and that they have a good group of friends at church and that they, you know, gain a lot of strength from their religious practice, this is a good opportunity for you to understand that patient has a high level of wellness in the spiritual um, area of your FHP. If, on the other hand, you're talking to your patient and you're talking about elimination and they say, you know, I have a really hard time going to the bathroom, you know, I don't move my bowels every day, I find that it can be really painful, and they're expressing, you know, concerns in that area, then you know this area is one for you to focus on when you're doing your nursing diagnoses. So what are they? Now, we're going to go through and I'm going to describe the pattern, the first one of which is health perception, health management. And then the next slide will be the actual questions that are on your FHP that you're going to bring into the clinical setting. So it might be helpful if you haven't already to print a copy of that functional health pattern. Go into Blackboard under clinical documents and find the FHP and print it out and then come back to the slide. Um, so the first pattern is health perception, health management, and this is how the client perceives their health, how healthy they perceive themselves to be and how they manage their health. It includes um, what activities they do right now, what they're planning for for the future. Um, it also includes health risk management and general health care behavior. So, if we move on to the next slide, it will look at the questions related to this functional health pattern. So, questions you would ask your patient. How has your general health been? Have you had any colds in the past year? Any absences from work? What do you feel is the most important thing you do to stay healthy? 
Do you think these things make a difference to your health? Do you use any cigarettes, alcohol, or other drugs? Do you do a regular breast or te testicular self-exam? Do you use any home remedies or folk remedies? And certainly if they said they did, you would want to ask them what they were and why they feel they're helpful. Um, in the past, has it been easy to find ways to follow instructions suggested from doctors or nurses? And if they're in the hospital for an acute illness or say they are in the long-term care setting with many chronic problems, it might be appropriate to ask what do you think caused this illness and what actions were taken when symptoms were perceived and were there any results from this? And then you want to ask, what are the most important things to you while you're here, whether that's the hospital or the long-term care setting, and how can we be most helpful? The second pattern is nutritional metabolic. This talks about food and fluid consumption relative to metabolic need. It includes daily eating times, types and quantity of foods and fluids consumed, what preferences the patient has for foods, um, whether they use any supplements. It also will describe breastfeeding and infant feeding patterns if you're um, doing this on a pediatric patient. And it also involves physical assessment of the patient's skin, hair, nails, their height and weight, and their BMI as well, which is on your physical assessment form, and also their body temperature. Questions on the FHP for nutritional metabolic begin with a food diary. So you want to tell your, ask your patient what they normally eat within a 24 hour period. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner on average. And that includes portion sizes. So if I tell you I have yogurt and blueberries and three cups of coffee and a bagel with cream cheese for breakfast. You know, is that a cup of yogurt? Is it a half cup of yogurt? How many blueberries? You know, does the person typically weigh their food? You want to make sure it includes the right portion sizes, accurate portion sizes. Um, and then for lunch, you know, I have a you know big salad and with a steak on the side, and sometimes I have fries. And you know, you want to make sure that you're getting an accurate picture of exactly what that person eats in a day. And then if they tell you they have you know salad for dinner, but then at night they have you know a bowl of ice cream and six cookies for a snack, make sure that you're writing all this down. Um, you also want to make sure you ask about supplements because some herbal medications can interact with prescription medications. Do they take any vitamins? Um, have they had a recent weight gain or loss or a height gain or loss? And you want to make sure you include the time frame. So someone who has gained five pounds over the last six months maybe not that much of a concern, whereas someone who's lost 25 pounds over the last four weeks, that's a pretty big loss. And you want to know, is that an intentional loss? Were they on a diet? Or is that an unintentional loss? How is the patient's appetite? Do they eat well? Do they have any trouble swallowing? Are they on any special diet restrictions? Um, and how do, their, how do they heal if they get a cut or an injury? Do they have any problems with their skin? Um, the condition of the patient's skin is important as well, including um, hair and nails and mucous membranes and teeth. Do they have any dental problems? So these are all questions you're gonna ask with regards to the patient's nutritional metabolic pattern. Elimination pattern talks about patterns of excretory function, bowel, bladder, and skin. It includes sweating. So it's the client's perceived regularity of excretory function that you want to ask about. So if they tell you, you know, I'm, I have trouble going to the bathroom, how, you know, ask them to describe what they feel is difficult when they're going to the bathroom. Oh, you know, I you know, I have to go to the bathroom at awkward times or, you know, I go to the bathroom six times a day and it's awkward and you want to make sure you know if they're taking laxatives, what laxatives they're taking, do they take them all the time. A lot of your patients in long-term care are going to be on multiple laxatives because constipation is a common problem in long-term care. So be prepared when you do your database assessment, you'll be writing down the patient's medications, 
you'll see many patients will have laxatives in the long-term care setting. Um, also, you want to ask about urinary elimination. Do they have any pain, frequency, or burning? And you're going to ask about sweating as well. When you talk about um, how patients' bowels move and how they pee, it can be awkward. So this is one of those situations where you're going to be hopefully having a good rapport with your patient and be able to make them feel comfortable enough that they'll be able to discuss this with you. Um, certainly your first few interviews might be a little bit awkward until you're used to asking these sorts of questions, but you might be surprised. Your patients may be more willing to discuss this stuff with you than you think. Um, and certainly if they're having a problem and they feel like you can help them, they'll be more than willing to share what's going on with them. So again, you're going to ask them, please describe, you know, what do your bowels look, you know, when you move your bowels, what does it look like? What is your stool characteristic? Is it loose? Is it firm? Is it hard to pass? Do it, have you ever passed blood in your stool? You know, what color is it? Um, any problem with control and of course use of laxatives. Ostomies are something that you'll be assessing when you do your physical assessment. It's a um, surgically created, um, trying to think of the best way to describe it. It's like a when someone has like a bowel obstruction, they might uh, have to remove a portion of the bowel and they'll take the bowel through the abdominal wall and an appliance is placed over the abdominal wall to catch the stool. Um, most of the patients that have ostomies are incontinent and it's a very specific assessment you're gonna do when a patient has an ostomy. If you assess an ostomy on your patient, go get your clinical instructor if you've never seen one before and you're not sure what you're looking at. If you're doing an assessment, a physical assessment on your patient and you see anything that you're not sure what you're looking at, go get your clinical instructor because chances are good that they'll be able to help you with the assessment and describe what it is you're seeing. Sometimes hernias can be pretty profound in some patients and you know you're going to want to make sure that you're comfortable when you do your physical assessment and you know what you're looking at and how to describe it in your note. Uh, getting a little off topic there but uh, urinary elimination you're going to ask them you know how often do you pee what color is it is it clear do you have any sediment that you notice any problems with controlling your urine um, any pain and a patient can also have a urostomy which is a um, opening where urine comes out through the abdominal wall. It's a surgically created opening. Um, funny story, I had a patient who was, uh, who I had in the hospital who came in who had a urostomy and he was a big golfer and um, he had developed a sling to hold his urostomy appliance when he was golfing so that he could kind of bend over and have a nice golf swing without the urostomy appliance kind of swinging in the breeze. He was a really cool guy. So, you know, when you encounter an unusual physical assessment finding, don't hesitate to ask the patient about it and also don't hesitate to get your clinical instructor to help with assessment. Um, if a patient feels like they have excess perspiration or odor problems, you can ask them about that. Um, and certainly in acute care, if you have a patient who has like some sort of drain, like say they had surgery and they have a bulb drain where they, um, you know, where the surgical wound is draining, um, or if they have something attached to suction, if it's something you don't understand or you're not sure what you're looking at, again, I can't stress enough, have your clinical instructor come and look at it with you and make sure that you do a thorough assessment. The next uh, functional health pattern is the activity exercise pattern. This describes a pattern of exercise, activity, leisure, and recreation. Um, factors that interfere with activity, which might be evidenced by vital sign changes. So a patient with bad COPD might not be able to walk down the hall without desatting. Um, and this includes your activities of daily living. So can the patient get up, shower themselves, get dressed? Do they have uh, the ability to cook food? Do they shop for themselves? Do they still go to work? And can they maintain their home? The functional health pattern questions associated with this pattern 
are um, asking your patient to talk about what their exercise pattern looks like. What do they normally do during a day for activity? Do they have leisure activities or specific uh, things they like to do for recreation? You're going to ask them, do they have enough energy to cook, shop, clean their house, take their own shower, get dressed? Um, do they work and can they maintain their home? Um, and all this will be recorded um, when you do like a functional assessment on your patient. Um, any factors that interfere with the desired or expected pattern, such as like cramping or any neuromuscular deficits, any uh, difficulty breathing or chest pain. And um, if you know the patient has heart failure, you can put that in your assessment. And if you know what class heart failure or COPD they have, you can put that in as well. Sometimes that's in the medical record. Also, you want to include what leisure patterns they have. Do they take a nap every afternoon? Do they take a walk after dinner every day? Um, and do they do this with uh, other people or do they exercise alone? Do they have enough energy for their required and desired activities? Um, do they have a specific pattern of exercise um, and how often do they do it? And what about leisure activities? And if it's a child, what about play activities? Do they have enough energy to run around on the playground with their friends? This is the list of ADLs and the perceived activity or ability code levels are down at the bottom. So a zero would be if you are completely independent with all of these things, you would be zero, 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 zero. If your patient in the nursing home needs some help um, or some supervision, you could put them down as like a level two for minimal help or a level three for some help or some assistance. And if the patient needs a total assist, they're, you know, say they've had a huge stroke and they can't move one side of their body, they are, would be considered needing total assistance or unable to assist you caring for them. So that's a level five. Sleep rest pattern talks about patterns of sleep, rest, and relaxation during a 24-hour period. This includes the client's perception of the quality and quantity of sleep and rest. So not only are you asking them how many hours do you sleep a night, but you want to ask them do you feel rested when you wake up? Um, what's their perception of their energy level? And you want to also ask about any sleep aids. Do they take Benadryl every night? You know, do they take a warm bath with lavender oil every night or have a sleep time tea before they go to sleep you know do they have a particular routine that helps them sleep the questions on your FHP regarding sleep and rest pretty much what I just said you're going to ask them to describe their pattern of sleep rest and relaxation you know do they sleep for six hours a night and then take a half an hour nap in the afternoon um, what you know, do they have difficulty going to sleep at night? So they might be a night owl going to bed at 2 a.m. and sleeping until 7, but then they find they, you know, get a little cat nap between 3 and 5. Um, everybody has different patterns that they've become accustomed to. And that's kind of what nice is nice about the functional health pattern is that you're not getting just one isolated snapshot of your patient, you're asking them what's the general pattern of your activity, like on average, how do you sleep at night? Um, again, you're going to want to make sure that they tell you the quality and the quantity of sleep and rest and how they feel when they wake up. Do they feel rested and ready for activities after sleep? Um, average bedtime, average time of awakening, any problems going to sleep at night, any medications or sleep aids, you can ask them about their dreams. Um, and early awakening is a common type of insomnia that happens in uh, mostly when people get older, they might wake up early and then be unable to go back to sleep. And do they have any um, rest or relaxation periods and any daytime fatigue or naps during the day? Cognitive perceptual pattern describes the sensory, perceptual, and cognitive patterns of your patient. So this will tell you, do they have the ability to see, smell, taste, and touch, and hear? Um, it also includes pain assessment and management and also cognition. So the patient's ability to produce and understand language, their memory, and their ability to make decisions.
the questions on the functional health pattern about the cognitive perceptual pattern, um, you're going to ask them to, you know, to, you're going to assess their sensory system. Um, do they have difficulty seeing? Do they have difficulty hearing? Do they have glasses or a hearing aid? Um, you're going to assess their cognition during your uh, physical exam by asking them orientation questions. So I'm going to ask them, can you tell me your name? Can you tell me where you are? Um, can you tell me the date today? So that if they answer all three questions correctly, they're alert and oriented times three. I also know by those few questions that they understand and they can produce language well. Um, so then when you go on to talk about cognitive functional abilities, you're also going to assess memory. You're going to assess decision making. So when you ask them, you know, do you find big decisions easy or difficult to make? Um, you're assessing their ability to make decisions. Um, you can ask what the easiest way for them to learn things is. If they are definitely a visual learner, you might want to give them written material versus giving them spoken um, information. Some patients learn best with videos and some patients are kinesthetic learners who actually have to do things before they can learn them. Um, you're gonna assess pain and ask if they have any pain right now. I always, when assessing pain, will ask a patient to rate it on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being no pain at all and 10 being the worst pain that you can imagine. So when your patient says it's a 12 and they're not grimacing or sweating, you, you might wanna rephrase that, like, okay, so 10 is the worst pain you've ever had and I see you here in front of me without any physical, like, signs of pain but you're saying it's a 12 like it's it's difficult because pain is a um, subjective thing but you want to always try to get your patient to quantify it as realistically as possible um, and then do they have any um, you know do they take pain medicines do they take Tylenol every day um, how do they manage their pain uh, level of consciousness I talked about this already if the patient's alert and oriented you know, A and O times three. Is their speech slurred or is it clear? And does the client have any short-term memory loss or long-term memory loss? This one is tough to assess in a kind of spot assessment. You can mention three things to them at the beginning of the interview, like, oh, this is a pen, a stethoscope, and this is my, you know, clipboard, and see if they remember them at the end of the assessment. You know, can you tell me those three things that I mentioned to you in the beginning of our interview? But this is one of those things that typically you're going to get information from the chart about. Um, some patients might have mild dementia um, in the long-term care setting, and it might be that you wouldn't notice in your you know, short FHP interview that they have cognitive problems, but when you, you know, dig a little deeper, you might find that they are not living on their own because they weren't able to manage their household or they had difficulty making decisions or you know, they had some memory loss. Self-perception, self-concept pattern talks about the self-concept patterns and perceptions of self by your client, including their attitudes about their self, um, what they perceive their abilities to be, and what their body image, identity, and general sense of worth is. This includes a pattern of body posture and movement, eye contact, voice, and speech pattern. So you're going to, to try and get the client to describe what their self-concept pattern is and what their perceptions of self is, including their attitudes about themselves, their perception of their abilities, their image, their identity, um, and their general emotional pattern. Uh, this includes their body posture and their movement, how they make eye contact, what their voice and speech patterns are, and make sure you remember that when you're doing this assessment, it's usually not effective unless the client has a sense of trust in the nurse. So you can ask these questions, but unless the patient feels comfortable and has a rapport with you, they might not be willing to answer them or they might not answer them truthfully. Um, one of the most difficult things I think about the health interview is that you really do have to have a good rapport with your patient in order to get them to open up about what's really going on with them. So the questions are, how do you de describe yourself most of the time? Do you feel good or not so good about yourself? 
any changes in your body or the things that you can do and you ask are these a problem for them um, any changes in the way you feel about yourself or your body um, do you find that things frequently make you angry or annoyed or fearful um, do you feel anxious or depressed do you feel not in control of things and if so what helps and you can also ask ever feel you lost hope some of these questions are really difficult, especially when asking them of elderly folks in the long-term care setting because many of them had been living independently and then were unable to go on living independently and so that's why they are in the long-term care facility and you might touch a nerve when asking these questions. So just be gentle and if your patient, you know, opens up or seems depressed or anxious, um, you know, stay with them and allow them to share their feelings and vent to you. And if you certainly, if a patient ever says to you that they're feeling unsafe or that they have a desire to harm themselves, that's an emergency situation that you want to make sure you notify your clinical instructor about right away. And you don't want to leave the patient to do that because they're a risk. If they express a desire or thoughts of self-harm, you want to make sure that you address that quickly and safely. Role relationship pattern talks about patterns of role engagements and relationships. It includes the client's perception of the major roles and responsibilities in their current life situation. And that includes satisfaction or disturbances in their family, work, or social relationships. The questions that you are going to ask for role relationship pattern will allow the patients to describe their pattern of role engagements and relationships, including the perception of the major roles and responsibilities in their current life situation. So you could start by saying, do you live alone? Do you live with a family? What's your family structure? And do you have any family problems that you have difficulty handling, either your nuclear or extended family? Um, do your family or others depend upon you for things and how has that been working out? How are they managing? Um, if it's appropriate, you can ask how the patient's family or others feel about their hospitalization or illness. If it's appropriate, you can ask if they have problems with their children, uh, any difficulties handling their, their kids' problems. Do they belong to any social groups? Do they have close friends? Do they ever feel lonely? Um, if they're still working, you could ask, do things generally go well at work? If they're at home or school, you could use those situations. And uh, you want to ask about if their income is sufficient for their needs. And if they do work, you know, you could ask them a little bit more about their work because a lot of people, you know, gain some uh, self self-respect, self-satisfaction from the kind of work that they do and often are more than willing to like talk about that and share that. And it can be really interesting to get your patient talking about what kind of work they, they do now or if they are retired, what they did before. Uh, the sexuality and reproductive pattern talks about patterns of satisfaction or dissatisfaction with sexuality. It talks about the reproductive pattern, which includes the female's reproductive stage, whether they have entered menopause or whether they, you know, also how many children they've had or pregnancies they've had. And it can also include the patient's gender identity if non-conforming. So for these questions, you want to ask the perceived satisfaction or disturbances in their sexuality or sexual relationship. Um, and you're also going to ask about the females, if it's a female you're interviewing, um, what their reproductive state is and if they have any perceived or actual problems, um, including any problems with menstruation and also how many pregnancies and children they have had. Um, if it's appropriate to age in situations, certainly in the long-term care facility, you do want to ask about, you know, do you, are you currently having a sexual relationship? Is it satisfying? Have you had any recent changes or problems with that? It may be that you, um, you know, that there may be patients in the nursing home that are having a sexual relationship, you know, and they may want to talk to you about it. They may have some difficulties and you may be able to help them with that. Um, oftentimes, if they're not having a sexual relationship, they'll just simply say, you know, I'm not involved with anyone now. And that's the end of it. But don't be afraid to ask the question. 
um, coping stress tolerance pattern. We'll talk about the patient's general coping pattern and effectiveness in terms of stress tolerance. Um, it includes the client's capacity to resist challenge to self-integrity. It includes resilience, which is hugely important. Um, it also includes the modes of handling stress or the patient's coping skills, identification of family or other support systems, and the patient's perceived ability to control and manage situations. The questions that you're going to ask, um, ask them how they handle stress. You know, um, you can start by asking if there've been any big changes in the life in their lives in the last year or two. Have you had any crises? Um, do you have um, family or other support systems that can help you? Um, who's most helpful in talking things over and are they available to you? Do you feel tense or relaxed most of the time? And if you feel tense, what helps you? Um, for coping skills, you can ask them if they use any medicines or drugs or alcohol. You can also ask if they use any sort of like me meditation or spirituality or some you know, other method of stress relief. And uh, when they have big problems, how do they handle them? And is that successful? The value belief pattern talks about patterns of values, goals or beliefs that guide choices or decisions. Um, it includes what's perceived as important in the client's life, their quality of life, and any perceived conflict in values or beliefs. This also includes the patient's spiritual beliefs. When you ask your patients about what their values are, you're gonna have them describe what their values, goals, or beliefs are, and that includes spiritual beliefs that guide their choices or decisions. So the questions on your sheet, um, you can ask them, do you generally get the things that you want from life? Um, do you have important plans for the future? What um, do you have, uh, is religion important in your life? And is, do you find this to be helpful? If they say yes, you can certainly ask questions about their religion if you choose to, um, just to get a little more information and to, you know, for your own learning and to figure out how to help this patient. And um, you can also ask if they have a spiritual practice that is helpful. Um, some people find that they, you know, use meditation or they, you know, might, use visualization or deep breathing or something that helps them, um, you know, help them manage their perception, I guess is a good way to, to look at it. So FHPs can be extremely useful during your assessment because they provide a framework not only for the patient's interview, but it can highlight areas of need. Certainly if you are talking about your patient, you know, their self-concept and they are despondent and they're feeling very sad and they tell you they're depressed and they tell you they have no hope for the future, that's an area of need. And you can absolutely use that information to create a nursing diagnosis for your patient and help them and figure out how to teach them to, you know, I want to say have a better mood, but depression doesn't really work like that. But you can certainly teach them healthy coping skills and how to ask for help and how to rely on, you know, the people that can help them. Um, please remember when you're doing this interview that it will build rapport with your patient and understanding. And sometimes you just have to sit and let your patient vent. That can be the most helpful thing is to be a good listener.